The Dunbar Armored Robbery On a quiet September night in 1997, as Los Angeles slept, six men were about to pull off what would become the largest cash heist in U.S. history at the time, $18.9 million. This story is of the Dunbar Armored Robbery, a meticulously planned operation that is almost the perfect heist. Let's break it down. Our tale begins with Alan Pace III, a 30-year-old man with big dreams who coincidentally was an employee at Dunbar Armored, working as a regional safety inspector. There, Pace was hatching a plan that would shake the foundation of the armored car company and set a new benchmark for audacious heists. As you can imagine, Pace's position at Dunbar gave him unprecedented access to the company's inner workings. As he went about his daily duties, inspecting facilities and checking security measures, his mind was busy mapping out every detail of the Los Angeles depot. He wasn't just looking at fire extinguishers and clear hallways. He was studying camera angles, memorizing guard rotations, and piecing together the perfect plan for a multi-million dollar robbery. But Pace knew he couldn't pull this off alone. He needed a team he could trust people who wouldn't crack under pressure or turn on him when the heat was on. So he turned to his childhood friends, Eugene Hill, Eric Boyd, Freddie McCrary Jr., Terry Brown Sr., and Thomas Johnson. No hardened criminal, just ordinary guys looking for a shortcut to the good life. Thanks to his extensive research, Pace was able to provide them with detailed maps, images, and information about the facility. They even conducted reconnaissance missions, driving to the building and familiarizing themselves with the area. The group made a pact. If any of them were caught, they wouldn't rat out the others. It was all for one and one for all. As the plan came together, fate threw Pace a curveball. On Thursday, September 11, 1997, he was informed that he was being fired from Dunbar Armored for tampering with company property. As part of a prank, he had removed a headlight from one of the armored trucks. This unexpected turn of events left Pace with a crucial decision. It's now or never. The next day, he would have to turn in his keys and lose access to the facility. But there was a silver lining in this cloud. The early hours of Friday morning were the perfect time to strike. From his insider knowledge, Pace knew the vault would be full of cash waiting to be distributed across the city in anticipation of weekend shopping. On the night of Thursday, September 12th, the group of would-be robbers gathered for a few hours at a party in Long Beach to establish alibis. Then they slipped away, donning black clothing and masks. They also put on radio headsets to communicate with each other and checked their weapons before driving the 25 miles to downtown Los Angeles. At this time of night, at this time of night, there was little traffic, and the journey took less than half an hour. It was just after midnight when the robbers arrived at the Dunbar facility in downtown Los Angeles. They were able to drive their rented U-Haul truck right into the parking lot without any issues. During the planning, Pace learned that the guards watching the parking lot camera had a new truck and kept the camera focused on his truck so he could keep an eye on it. What attention to detail, right? So to get inside, Pace simply opened the side door and the robbers entered. Now, their first task was to evade detection from the various security cameras placed throughout the hallways. Thanks to Pace's meticulous planning, they hugged the walls and moved during timed intervals to slip past the rotating cameras unseen. The bandits made their way to the cafeteria, where they quickly took the catering staff hostage. At 12.30 a.m., most of the guards went for their lunch break, as each guard arrived at the cafeteria, the robbers ambushed them and took them hostage one by one, preventing them from raising the alarm or alerting other guards. All captured guards were laid face down and had their arms and ankles bound with duct tape. The robbers also took the key to the vault preparation room from one of the hostage guards. The room had cameras that couldn't be avoided, so the robbers simply rushed in on the two armed guards and took them hostage as well. Now the robbers needed to get into the vault which had 18-inch thick steel doors. However, due to the volume of money being moved through the facility on a Friday night, the vault had been left open for ease of use. It's hard to tell if it was all a great plan or if luck was just totally on their side. Well, luck or not, the robbers entered the vault and, using bolt cutters, broke the common padlocks on the metal cages storing the bags of cash. 
The money in the vault was sorted by delivery routes, and Pace had memorized which routes had high denomination bills. He had his team avoid bags with new cash with sequential serial numbers. They primarily grabbed stacks full of $20 bills that were destined for the city's ATMs. The robbers quickly loaded the bags of cash onto metal carts, which they wheeled to the loading dock. They backed their trucks up to the dock and loaded it up. In about 30 minutes, they moved $18.9 million in cash. Pace had two final tasks before they split up. He stole the security tapes from the recording system in the security control room, and then he ran to the locked closets elsewhere in the facility to steal the secret backup security tapes from the recording equipment housed in a locked cabinet. As they left, the robbers also smashed the cameras. And just like that, as if it were nothing, without a single shot fired, Alan Pace and his team had carried out the largest cash robbery in US history. The robbers went to one of their apartments and changed into their party clothes. They returned to the house party in Long Beach and partied it up. At this point, most robbers would be impatient and giddy. They'd flash their money and go on wild spending sprees. However, these robbers were smarter than most. Pace gave each crew member $100,000 to use on quiet, discreet spending. According to their agreed-upon plan, the rest of the cash would have to wait until things cooled down. The robbers packed the remaining $18.2 million into garbage bags and moved them to a storage facility for safekeeping. A task force was quickly formed involving local police, the FBI, and other federal authorities to investigate the heist. The Dunbar Company and its insurer, Lloyds of London, offered a $125,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the robbers. However, authorities were soon baffled. There were no fingerprints. There were no names. While talking during the robbery, the robbers had called each other by numbers. There was also no video evidence of the crime. The only thing the investigators were sure of was that this was an inside job. Someone with intimate knowledge of Dunbar Armored Facility operations had been involved, especially since the robbers knew the backup security tapes existed and stole those as well. Authorities interviewed employees at the facility, hoping someone knew something, just something. One of the questions asked during these meetings was, which employee do you think could have committed this crime? Interestingly, Alan Pace's name kept coming up. The only significant clue authorities had was a small plastic rear light lens found on Dunbar's loading dock that didn't belong to any company vehicle. The FBI forensic lab in Washington analyzed it and determined it came from a 14-foot U-Haul truck, but this promising lead was a dead end. There were many U-Haul trucks rented in the Los Angeles metropolitan area at the time of the robbery, so the only name they had was Allen's. They checked if he had rented a van during the time of the robbery. Of course he hadn't. He had been so careful with that. Investigators kept an eye on him. They even dug into his financial records. However, they uncovered nothing. Alan was living quietly at his mother's house. He hadn't made any flashy purchases. He stayed away from the storage center where the money was hidden. It turns out Alan didn't even have a bank account. The trail went cold. More than six months passed. Alan, with caution, began distributing money among his crew. He planned to invest his shares in rental properties, retire, and simply live off his investments. Slowly, the robbers began buying cars and properties with cash. They used straw buyers to acquire at least 10 homes during public foreclosure auctions. They allowed families to live in these houses or rent them out. It was the heist of the century and, for a while, things were smooth sailing. But about two years after the heist, one of the robbers, Eugene Hill, made a rookie mistake that brought the whole operation crashing down. He hired a real estate broker to purchase some property and handed over a stack of cash still wrapped in the original straps from the robbery. The broker got spooked and tipped off the cops. The authorities didn't take long to connect the dots. Based on the dates and handwriting on those stamps, they realized the cash was part of the haul from the Dunbar job. Just like that, the crew's dreams of an early retirement went up in smoke. Authorities investigated Eugene's financial records and also subpoenaed thousands of U-Haul records. They learned that Eugene had rented a 14-foot U-Haul one day before the robbery and had returned it one day after. When police arrested Eugene, they found more cash in the original wrappers in his possession. 
And so, in one single confession, the whole thing fell apart. Eugene sang like a bird in exchange for a lighter sentence. Allen and the other five robbers were arrested and tried in the spring of 2001. To the bitter end, Allen played the innocent, denying any involvement in the robbery. He tried pinning the whole thing on his so-called friends, claiming they were just out for revenge after he got a little too close to one of their wives. His act didn't fool anyone, though. Four of Allen's gang ended up pleading guilty, scoring themselves prison terms ranging from seven and a half to ten years. The fifth robber got slapped with 17 and a half years behind bars. As for the criminal mastermind himself, Allen was hit with a hefty 24-year sentence. But that wasn't all. The entire crew was on the hook for $18.9 million in restitution. The authorities managed to claw back around $7 million from the heist, most of which had gone towards fancy houses, slick rides, and other toys. A few hundred thousand was chalked up to being burned to a crisp or blown in Vegas. But the word on the street is there's still a cool $10 million stashed away somewhere. Until now, that hideout has remained hidden. Alan is scheduled to be released shortly after serving his sentence. Once free, one wonders if the old dog will have one last trick to secretly recover his lost loot, change his identity, and spend his final years sipping cocktails on a beach somewhere. I'm sure the thought of that early retirement has kept him going during those long, lonely nights in jail. Only time will tell if Alan's criminal career has a fairy tale ending or if this really is the last chapter in the saga of the audacious Dunbar heist. Now, like this video, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more.